for goodness sake. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for goodness sake. Yeah. Oh, goodness sake. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Oh, my goodness. Goodness. Hmm. Kind of gotten a rough rap these days. Goodness has. The world sometimes can seem like it's less and less good. In fact, I have a prayer request that we didn't include in our other time, praying for terrorism over the world to be ended. This is 9-11, the 21st celebration, if you can say that, or recognition of the terrorist attack in New York. It is a 20th celebration of one not being repeated. And we need, we need as the church, to rise up because goodness starts in the house of God. It starts with us. Repentance begins in the house of God. It starts with us. Revival begins in the house of God. It starts with us. And so, Father, for this world to be godly, this world needs God. And so we are praying for revival here within Family Worship Center, within our campuses, within our lives, within our homes. We are praying in Jesus' name, Lord, that you will bring goodness into our lives and that you will bring goodness across this world by a revival in your church. Let it transpire in us today and let it please your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, dear ones, I also want to mention there are surveys in the back. Uh, if you haven't filled out one yet, I really want to know and hear from you because it's important for us to just have that connection together. I want to say good morning to Steve, good morning to Beth, good morning to Charlene, good morning to Robert and Betty, good morning to John and Kirsten and Rush, good morning to Drew. I'm so glad you're with us, Drew. Good morning to Carla, good morning to Anne. I was praying for you this week. Good morning, Audrey. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, David. God bless you. Thursday night, David and Betty and Robert will be together. Good morning. Oh, Pastor Zach is with us, too. I know he's out of town for a wedding, but he's, he's with us online. So good morning, Pastor Zach. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> You've heard that. You've heard people use that. Before we talk about, oh, for goodness sake, Take your Bible in hand and stand with me, if you would, dear ones. We're going to make this declaration together. This is my Bible. It is the incomparable, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I choose to live as it calls me to live. I'm open and ready to receive from God's living word. You may be seated. We're going to open up to Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, and I want you to turn there. But i got to tell you about this lady. She kept driving by this old neighborhood where she would see this old guy who was sitting on the porch. And this old guy, every day she'd drive past this old guy sitting on his front porch in his rocking chair, just rocking back and forth. And she just decided one day to just stop because this guy always seemed like he was happy. And she asked the old man, so how are you? He said, oh, I'm doing good. She said, you seem happy. He said, I, I am happy. He said, well, can you tell me what the secret of your, your, your happy life is? He says, well, I smoke three packs of cigarettes every day. I drink a quart of bourbon, I eat nothing but junk food, and I don't exercise a bit. And she said, really? How old are you? 26. <laughs> Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, it says, and, and read it with me. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Mm, that is a good call. In fact, we're going to start with a good call in a moment. But first, oh, for goodness sakes. Oh, my goodness. People use that expression. And what it is, is it's, it's a figure of speech, what we would call an idiom. And this idiom is used to describe annoyance. Oh, for goodness sake. 
or frustration. Oh, my goodness. Or surprise. Oh, my goodness. But it has become what is referred to as a contronym. A contronym means it has taken on the contrary meaning. Instead of being for goodness, it means the opposite of goodness. Goodness is getting a bad rap. Goodness has, within our culture, been pushed down, turned inside out, and tossed in the trash. We see a culture today that calls evil good and calls good evil. And so it's no surprising that goodness itself has become a contronym. But it's not really a contronym to us. To us, oh, it's an expression of the goodness of our God. We appreciate his goodness. And with the goodness that he is, he has given us a good call. A good call. You and I have been called of God to live a life of goodness. In fact, that's what this passage says. Therefore, as we, that's you and me, isn't it? Yeah, that's you and me. That's us. As, as we have opportunity, opportunity. We get opportunities all the time to do nice things, don't we? Let somebody else have the parking spot, or hold open the door for somebody, use our manners, do something kind for someone. As we have opportunity, let us, there it is, it's you and me again, isn't it? Again, we and us, let us do good. That's the call of God. It's a good call. It's a call to do good. Do good to most people. Oh, is that not what it says? Oh, it's, I'm sorry, I misread. Do good to those who are nice to us. Did I misread it again? Oh, my. Could this be a misprint? It actually says, do good to all. Is that what your Bible says? Oh, my. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Do good to all. And then it goes on and it says, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Hmm. Why should we do that? I mean, we've gotten Paul here telling us in Galatians, you guys ought to do good stuff. You should do good things to people. You should be good for goodness sake. You should do good. Why? Well, because Jesus went about doing good. Jesus was always doing good. Is that in the Bible? Would I tell you something that's not? Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Peter preaching. He says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good. You got it. That's what he did. He went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. I want you to understand, this is so important, with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good. When the Holy Spirit, with his amazing, incredible, beautiful power, is the influencing factor within your life, what transpires? You do good. Now, we can say you love people. Well, love Yes, love results in good. Love is the compassionate feeling. It is that dynamic of appreciation and value and esteem for someone. But when you truly love, what are you going to do? You're going to do good to people. You're going to be good to people. So the Holy Spirit is linked with doing good, isn't he? That shouldn't surprise us because if we take one page back in the book of Galatians from chapter 6, verse 10, go back to, it's on the same page if you're using a Bible from the seats here. Same page, Galatians chapter number 5 brings us the fruit of the Holy Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness. 
faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. Now, of course, the firstborn gets most of the attention. Yeah, yeah. We all love talking about love. The firstborn gets a lot of that. And the lastborn, who needs some more (laughs) self-control. And all of us do. Let's just be honest with that, right? But the middle child, oh, the middle child, (laughs) that can be just, oh, driving down the road. Where's Mark? Is he in the car? George, turn around. We left him home again. (laughs) Most middle children know that experience where the family left and they forgot to take you with them because you're the middle child. And yeah, goodness gets left behind all too often. And if we are depending upon our culture to help us remember to take goodness with us, it's going to be a long, long wait. Because our culture is the one that's changed goodness into a countronym. We need to be counter culture. We need to say, make sure we got that middle child with us if we're going to travel anywhere. We need to take goodness with us. Goodness. (laughs) Goodness really is important. It's a good call. When you understand the context of this passage of Galatians 6.10, as well as chapter 5, but 6.10, you understand the context. This is not a good call. This is a great call because it was raised up in the midst of good grief. So let's take a look at that together. Good grief, Charlie Brown. (laughs) Another contronym. Oh, my. Good grief. Paul can tell us a lot about good grief. He experienced a lot of that within his life. We're called in the midst of whatever circumstances we are to bring goodness along with us for the ride because people have a natural hesitation to do good until somebody does good to you. Why? This is part of our fallen nature. Doing good before someone does good to you, is counterculture. It's becoming more and more counterculture. We see this, as Jesus talks about it, as being counterculture, nothing new, that it is counterculture. Because all the way back in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, in fact, keep your fingers in Galatians because we're coming back to Galatians. But if you go over to Matthew chapter number 5 and we go to Jesus, Magna Carta, his great charter, his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And chapter number five, Jesus tells us that we need to live out healthy actions rather than unhealthy reactions. Because most of us live our lives reacting rather than purposeful living. God wants us to live purposefully not accidentally, and not reactively. Look at Matthew chapter 5, and we'll start at verse number 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemies. Common saying. In fact, seven different times within the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will say, you have heard. In other words, this is what the culture teaches you. But I'm telling you, and he brings a counterculture message. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. That's not reacting negatively, is it? That's taking decisive, positive action. Bless those who curse you. Do, what's that word? Good. Good. It says do good to those who hate you. Is that your, does your Bible say that too? Hmm, do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Why? Why? Why would you do those things? Jesus answers, he says, that you may be sons of your Father. 
sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love only those who reward, love you, what reward do you have? Don't even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren, only what you do more than others? Or what do you do more than others? Don't even tax collectors do that? Therefore, you shall be perfect like your Father in heaven is perfect. That doesn't mean that you're never going to screw up. Because we're going to mess up plenty. But to be like Father means you love people. Not reactionarily, but with action that is from him with goodness. Goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yes, it should be my goodness. And it should be yours, too. We need goodness flowing through our lives. Now, let's take the context of that passage of Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. We go back to that passage of Scripture, and we see the Apostle Paul telling us that we need to do good, he says, as we have opportunity to do good to all. Do good to all? Well, who is he writing this to? Chapter 1 and verse 2, you see the Apostle Paul is writing, and he says, this is to the churches of Galatia. Okay, who are the churches of Galatia? Well, on Paul's what's described as his first missionary journey, and it wasn't, because it was actually, if you count it, probably his fourth missionary journey because he was doing missionary work at Damascus after he got saved. He was then sent as apostle to Tarsus to reach the Gentiles there. Then he came down to Antioch, Syria, and helped Barnabas there in ministry. This was his fourth missionary journey, but because they went to a number of different places, they tend to refer to it as a journey, not just a destination. So we'll, we'll take it as his first missionary journey. They go through Cyprus, beautiful island there, third biggest island in the Mediterranean. And then they head to the Via Sebaste. Now, the Via Sebaste is a Roman road, about 20 feet wide, paved with stone, started in 6 BC. Why would you want to have a Roman road through the province of Galatia. Well, that's the way the military was able to keep those cities and that entire province under control. It was a military road, but it brought incredible commerce because you got a good road protected by the military. That makes a good place for commerce. So, Paul heads there. He goes to Perga, and then he goes up to Antioch, Pisidia. Not Antioch in Syria, Antioch, Pisidia. And then they go over to Iconium, 80 miles to the east. Then they go down about 25 miles or so to the southwest to go to Lystra. And then they head over east to Derby. That's the missionary journey. What happened? He's writing now to these Galatians. He's telling these Galatians, these churches in Antioch, Pisidia, in Lystra, in Derby, in Iconium, he's saying, you guys, you need to do good to all. But what happened? Well, first of all, Paul, when he got to Perga, he describes how sick he got. Most historians think he contracted malaria. They did not have hydrochloroquine to help with malaria. So not only do you get sick and almost deathly sick, and yes, many people die from it, but the remnants afterwards can leave you drained, physically drained. So he gets malaria. Then he gets up to Antioch, Pisidia, and they start a new church, and the Gentiles are getting saved left and right, and the Jewish leaders got jealous. And so they took and got together with the city leaders and <laughs> gave them the right foot of fellowship. Well, maybe it was the left foot of fellowship. <laughs> kicked him out, not just of the church, the area. Then They kicked him out of the city. They ran him out of Antioch, Pisidia. So they head down the Roman road, the Via Sebaste, to make it to Iconium. 
like 80 miles by foot when you're probably still not feeling all that great. But he and Barnabas head over to Iconium. What happens in Iconium? They start preaching the gospel again. A church is formed. A whole bunch of Gentiles get saved. And what happens? The Jewish leaders get jealous. So what do they do? They attempt to murder him. The murder plot is found out, and Barnabas and Paul barely escaped. So they try to murder him. They head down to Lystra. Now they're going to get over to Lystra, and that's a really good long one-day journey, probably two. If you're not feeling good, it could be more. So they get down to Lystra. What happens? That's, that's the place where in, in Acts when they thought Barnabas and Paul, after they healed a man, they start thinking these are Roman gods or Greek gods. And they, they want to sacrifice to them, and Paul and Barnabas have to stop it. All these Gentiles are getting saved. Once again, really cool, but now we got a problem because word is spread back to Iconium, back to Antioch. Paul is doing it again. Now he's in Lystra, and a whole bunch of the Gentiles are getting saved. And so they take leaders from Iconium, leaders from Antioch, meet with the leaders of Lystra, and they literally stone Paul and leave him for dead outside the city. They assumed he was dead. Whether Paul was dead, don't know. Luke takes, and he writes like in 10 verses, an incredible pl plethora of information. And it's like, stop condensing, dude. I want to know more. <laughs> it just says, no, they stoned him, left him for dead outside the city. But the believers came around him and prayed over him. He got back up and went back into the city. <laughs> Whether God healed him or resurrected him, I don't know. But he was stoned, left for dead. So they head off to Derby. In Derby, false teachers rise up. They harass the new believers, and they continue to become an ongoing struggle. This is the context of Galatians 6.10. Understand this. He says, do good to all, and that includes the horrible, lying, deceiving, murderous people that perpetrated all kinds of evil against them. So when Paul says do good to all, he's not saying, okay, like if somebody's like good to you, you can like reciprocate, be good to them. He's saying do good to all, including the horrible, lying, deceiving, murderous people. That's, that's quite a context, isn't it? Now you can understand when he makes that statement, that's, a, that's really counterculture. That is really going against the grain, really going against what would seem like common sense. But Jesus said it's not about common sense. He said, this is so you can be like Father. If you want to be like Father, you need to do good those, to those who don't do good to you. Father, he, he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good. He brings the rain on the just and the unjust. Father is good all the time, and all the time, he is. It is his nature. And if you and I are going to be identified by him, you know what? We've got to have goodness flowing in our lives. We have to have goodness. And it's, let me just bring this down to where some rubber meets the road. Like in your household, okay. With your brother, with your sister, okay. Like with your parents, like with your kids, okay, okay. If Paul can ask the Galatians to do good to people who literally stoned him and left him for dead, you can be nice to your family. <laughs> Would you agree? Would you agree? That's, that's fair. Now, if, if Paul could... Do good and, 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 and still be nice to those who literally stoned him. That person at work that annoys you, don't raise your hand because a coworker might be here. <laughs> 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 you, 
you can do good to them, can't you? You can still do good. Yeah. At home, at work, wherever you, you could still do good. Not because you feel like it, but because that's what Father would do. And we want to be like Father. If you're going to be full of the Spirit, goodness is just going to be there. You can't help it. And he says, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So do good to everybody. Why would he say especially to those of the household of faith? Because you're trying to build up the people that are trying to make the difference in the rest of the world. And we need it. We need each other. We need each other. We need each other. And especially the household of faith, I need to encourage you. I need to build you up. I need to strengthen you. Why? So you can go out and do good. And you can be like, Father. And you can influence this culture, which is so corrupt and degrading. We need to be doing it especially because this is also a sanctuary. We call it that. We say, well, here in the sanctuary. <laughs> the sanctuary is supposed to be a safe place. Now, you'll notice something when I interact with you. I will never tease you. I just don't do that. I will not give you a nickname or a put down. I just won't do that. I don't use sarcasm. That's not my nature. Not because it's not my nature now. Oh, wait, it used to be my nature. <laughs> it was who could use the biggest put down? Who could humiliate another person the worst? Before I was saved, that was the nature of conversation. The meanest, cruelest statement you could make, who could master that? But when I got saved, I realized that's, that's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit builds up. The Holy Spirit edifies. And I am extra cautious, very careful, extremely careful, because I don't want to offend your spirit. I want you to know you're safe here. I'm not going to put you down. I will not humiliate you. I will do my best in my failed and human way. I am a sinner like everyone else, but I will do my best to build you up. I will try hard. I'm going to try to care for you the best I can because we're supposed to be like Father. And you need my help, and I need your help, and we need each other. So especially the household of faith, let's be really good to each other. Let's foster goodness so much that goodness overflows out into the rest of the culture. Call it paying it forward. Paying it forward. You know what that is? It's just sowing and reaping. You're sowing goodness, and it's going to come back to you. It does. It does. It comes back over and over again. And it says, especially to the household of faith, caring for the church. I'm going to ask you in a couple of weeks, I'm going to start asking next week, giving you a sign-up, to be part of a small group. We're going into fall. We're going to do small groups again. I've got my small group meeting this Thursday. Just encourage one another. And accountability, don't forget, guys. Do your devotions every day. <laughs> we'll have accountability and encouragement. And I'm encouraging you to be part of a small group. Why? So we can build each other up. So we can build goodness and give you a safe place with other believers that will help you become more like Father. So, time to chat for a bit. Time to interact. You can give your phone and text me a message. How can you, personally, how can you do good at school or work or at home or the marketplace? Just give me a couple ideas of how you could do good that would be a little extra more than what you are doing right now. How can you do good? Go ahead and text me. How could you do good? School, work, home, marketplace. I want you to generate some ideas now. We still have seven and a half minutes left. 
And I've allotted this time for you to interact with me so that we can chat about doing good. What can you do different? All right? So as, as you're pondering that and, and getting that ready, yeah. You want to be like Father. Father is just so consistently, so amazingly, so graciously. She's so good. try to display it, try to make it mine because he's put his Holy Spirit in you and me. So goodness is already there. You don't have to make it happen. You just have to let the Holy Spirit flow through you. Here are some of your responses. Doing good, most people really need to be encouraged. It's like a breath of fresh air. Encourage and be encouraged. I love that. I love that. I love that. We are called to be encouragers, aren't we? Yes. Build people up. Here's another one. It says, asking differently abled people if they want a healing prayer. Asking disabled people if they want healing prayer. That is so cool. Loving people. Asking, can I pray for you? 
Try to anticipate needs and fill them even before they are asked for. That is so cool. Here's another one. You said, spend more time in the Word. Share Jesus with more new people. That would be good. Offer strangers a smile and a friendly greeting. Taking time for loved ones even when I'm busy. I like that. Here's another one. It says, I can do good to others by not only listening but truly hearing what they're saying. Respond accordingly. Being a good listener. I like that. Here's another one. It says, be friendly. Say hello. Really listen to people when they talk and show them you care. Be willing to help. I like that. This one says, when at a drive through Pray for the person behind you. That's cool. Encourage others through biblical positive and affirming words. Lift up others when they are down. Good. This one says, (laughs) just says, be nice to Josh. I don't know who that's from, but I'm going to assume Josh is probably a sibling. Because being nice to your little brother or little sister is extra grace required, right? EGR, extra grace required. (laughs) This one says, surround yourself with good influences and stay positive. That will help build goodness. This one says, by helping with something even when when not being asked to. That is true. This one says, listen with an open mind. Mm Mm-hmm. This one says, taking the few minutes to interact with others instead of hurrying off to finish laundry and a list of tasks. When I don't do this, it makes people not feel important and cared for. Neat. That's, you're being sensitive. That is so cool. It says, say good morning to everyone. Yes, greeting people makes such a difference. Wishing people a blessed day. That's a good one. This one says, help people when they need it. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, make sure I don't have any others in here. Here's one. Talk less, listen more. Hmm. Yeah. Good. All right. Oh, for goodness sake. (laughs) Let's contextualize that goodness. The first word that was in this passage of Scripture is said, therefore, right? Galatians 6.10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good. You know, whenever you see the word therefore, it means based upon what came in before it. Look at what came before it. If you take and you look at verse 7, don't be deceived, God's not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows that, he will also reap. He who sows to the flesh, well of the flesh, reap corruption. He sows to the spirit, well of the spirit, reap everlasting life. And don't miss out on verse 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good. It's easy to grow weary when you're doing good when you have malaria. You can get weary. When you're not feeling good, when you're feeling under the weather, whatever, when you're tired, when you're aching, it's harder and it's easy to get weary, isn't it? When people are saying, we don't want you around here, and even kicking you out, it's harder to be good. You can get weary. Don't be weary in doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. Don't lose heart, my dear ones. Don't lose heart. Keep doing good. Do more good. Drive people nuts with how good you are. (laughs) I can guarantee pretty much because of the counterculture element that goodness brings in the midst of a culture which is so obsessed with canceling people, your goodness is instead loving people. Wow. Stand with me as we close in prayer. Now some of you, let's be honest, can we be honest? This is a struggle area. And you probably have one or two EGRs, extra grace required people within your life. We need to repent of not having a father's heart. And we need to say we're sorry for not loving everyone because everyone needs our love. So would you pray with me? Write out loud, say, Dear Jesus, 
You didn't die just for me, but for the whole world. Because you love every human. And you've called me to be like you. To be like my father. Not just do good to those who are good to me. But to do good to everyone. That's a really big call. I'm sorry for the times I failed in that. Please forgive me. I know you've paid for my sin. I don't want to just repent, though. I want to change. I want to be like you. I want you to be pleased with me. I want you to love my attitudes because I have the right attitudes. And I foster goodness because of my attitudes. Help me choose goodness and be good to all to be like you, Father, and bless your heart because I am your child. I surrender my life to you. I turn away from the negative garbage of this culture and I choose to walk in goodness. Show me my opportunities. Show me more opportunities. Help me be awake to them so I can love people who especially need it because I am your servant and I'm going to do what you want me to do. This week belongs to you and I belong to you. We're going to go out and do good together, Jesus. Lead the way because I'm following you. Amen. Amen. Now next week, my dear ones, happens to be Back to Church Sunday, where we, hello, you know, you ain't been in church for a while. Would you come with me, son? I'll take you out for lunch afterward. <laughs> you reach out to everyone you can. Let's get everyone in church. Let's pack this place to the gills next week. Can we do that? I love you, dear ones. God bless you. Have a great day. And if you can, join us in Algoma. God bless.